Hello, hello and welcome to this Classics Now event. This is the opening of our 2023 festival and I'm very happy and excited to have our two guests this evening who are joining us from the US, uh, from California and from Tennessee. And they're both professors and they're both very eminent, but this conversation is going to have a, a kind of a casual and informal um, style. And I'd like to introduce, first of all, Helen Morales, who holds the Argyropoulos Chair in Hellenic Studies in the University of California. She's the author of Classical Mythology, A Very Short Introduction, and her book, Antigone Rising, The Subversive Power of the Ancient Myths, which was published in 2020, has been described as galvanizing, and it certainly is. It's also very inspiring. Um, it's, it's really struck a chord with readers, with critics, and especially with students, with young people, and, and uh, not only students of classics, but also of literature and theater studies, because she has a way of making connections with cultural figures today, such as Greta Thunberg or Beyonce, and linking those to classical myth in, in ways that are very surprising and, and really thought provoking. And she writes about uh, the, the possibility of subversive power that comes through our new readings and recreations of classical myth. And in her, in the preface to Antigone Rising, she says that these contemporary recreations um, are posing the question of who owns classical antiquity and who owns culture. And the answer, the response is, we do. Um, Stephanie McCarter is professor of classical literature at the University of the South in Tennessee. She is a Latinist and she's published widely on Roman literature. And her new book, just published, is a, a new translation into English from the Latin of Ovid's compendious epic poem, The Metamorphoses. Um, and it is a delight. She has translated it into um, iambic pentameter, that five beat line that we all know so well and so familiar with from English poetry. And it really has a spring in its step. It, it just, it sort of flies along and it's got such verve and energy and fluidity, but it also has the most crystalline clarity, um, particularly in, in its rendering, in Stephanie's rendering of the descriptions and depictions of sexual violence that we find throughout of its poem that he gives us in his, in his retelling of the myths. And Stephanie has written in her introduction to the translation that she views the poem as a study, as a study in power. And I think that's going to be one of the themes of this, this conversation over the next 40 minutes or so. And, and it's, it's just a very imp important theme. Uh, she also writes about the need to understand the complexity of Ovid and uh, its, its, its beauty and also its brutality. And so I think between these two, these two scholars and authors, there is, there's going to be a lot to, to talk about and to tease out. I'm so happy uh, to have these two writers opening our festival and, and for joining us virtually in Dublin for Classics Now. So I'm going to hand over now to Helen Morales and to say thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, I'm so thrilled to uh, be here with you all, even virtually, um, to be part of the Classics Now Festival, um, to discuss Greek and Roman myth, and to talk to you, Stephanie, about your stunning new translation um, of Ovid's Metamorphoses for um, Penguin. Um, so I think I'm going to return to to some of the things that Helen said in her in her introduction and just uh, about the brutality and the brut uh, the beauty and brutality of Ovid. You say um, to read Ovid with an eye toward his full complexity, his beauty and his brutality allows us to scrutinize our own thorny relationship with the past and with the ambivalent inheritance 
we have received from it. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit about what you meant by that. You know, I think that when we, when, if you even think of the word classics, right? So classics are something that you emulate and you put on a pedestal. And so we want the relationship we have with the past to be deferential in a way. Um, certainly with the classical past, right? We, you know, we, we, we are somehow um, less than in, in who we are, um, I think often in the way we think of our relationship with the past, but I don't think that's true, of course. I mean, in so many ways we have, um, I, I think that we are more enlightened than a lot of people were in the past. And so to me, um, it's recognizing that our relationship with the past doesn't need to be simply deferential. We can correct the past. We can see that we've inherited horrific things from the past and that the pa and by reading these authors we can learn a bit about some of the more awful aspects of who we are as well and so to me it's you know it's about allowing the people in the past to be human um to be capable of horrible things and really intelligent things just as we ourselves are and um so to me that's part of learning about your own humanity is, through studying the works of antiquity means to acknowledging that you are not just learning about ennobling virtues. That sometimes you have to tangle with what makes us horrible <laughs> as well as wonderful, right? Um, the great word in Greek, dinos, right? We are both wonderful and awful, <laughs> right? And um, certainly are. Up, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, which is, you know, when I, I think why. I mean, I think about this in terms of Ovid, but I think that your book opens it up to all to many aspects of the past, you know, not just to mythology, but to, you know, ancient medicine, right? Uh, to the pl ancient policing of women's bodies. And so we really inherit this in numerous ways and not just through the stories that we've inherited, but through, you know, the way that our, the way our medical knowledge, we can trace that back in a lot of ways to, to Greek and Roman antiquity and to recognize that that's not always been a positive inheritance, that sometimes that's, that's held us back. I mean, if you think of the history of hysteria, for example, um, mm. then, you know, I think we have to, to, again, not just simply take a deferential relationship toward the past, but, but see that sometimes that's been um, something we need to, to disentangle ourselves from and the only way to do that really is to confront the 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 the, you know, the ambivalence of the inheritance that we have mm -hmm. okay well i want to i want to pursue some of the things that you've said but before we do that should we, should we just jump in with sure. one of Ovid smiths um <laughs> and maybe you could you could read just choose choose one you would like and, and read a bit of it. And then we could talk about that. And so to, to pin down some of the broader things that we're going to be talking about. Absolutely. Well, as I was rereading your book, um, I was struck by your reading of the Erisichthon myth. And so I thought that might be a good place to start because that's one of my absolute favorites. Um, mm. And it's uh, told by a river god who's, a, who's an interesting uh, creature, uh, creature, Achelous. I say creature because he's 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 hospitable, but he's also owns up to being a rapist, and so he's an interesting character. Um, but so this is uh, where Erisichthon is chopping down a sacred oak tree of Ceres, and cutting down trees was really symbolic in the ancient world of impiety. Um, oak trees often were associated with nymphs and deities. So this is um, this is this scene uh, from Book Eight. That oak soared up above the other trees as much as trees soar up above the grass. Yet Erisichthon did not keep his sword away from it, but told his slaves to chop the sacred oak. He saw them hesitate to do his bidding. So that scoundrel snatched an axe from one of them and spoke these words. If this tree were the goddess, not just one she loves, its crown would still smash to the earth. He spoke, and as he aimed the axe to strike it sideways, Ceres oak tree shook and groaned. Its leaves and acorns started turning pale. Its stretching boughs turned pale. When his unholy hand thrust a wound into that trunk, blood flowed from its cracked bark, as when a giant bull falls dead before the altars and gore spills out of its severed neck. They're stunned. One brave soul tries to stop such wickedness by checking that ruthless axe. When Erisichthon sees him, he says, Here's your reward for piety. He turns the axe on him and lops his head off, then goes to chop the tree again. 
A voice resounded from the middle of the oak. I'm Ceres' favorite nymph within this tree. I'm dying. I predict, to ease my death, that you will pay the price for what you've done. But he persists in crime. The oak starts swaying from countless strikes. The tugged ropes bring it down at last, its great weight toppling many trees. Down came the, <laughs> down came the oak. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, such it's extraordinary isn't it um so when you're talking about not being deferential to the past or, or and, and thinking about how um Ovid resonates today could you say a bit more about how this myth in particular um mm -hmm. is an example of that well in some ways I think it nicely illuminates that Ovid himself is telling stories we should be critical of. As I said, this is a story told by Achelous, who's this really odd river god. Um, and he, um, well, you know, I don't think we're supposed to like him too terribly much. Um, mm. But, you know, he clearly um, sees chopping down this particular tree as an act of violence that to me is really akin and I think your book brings this out really nicely in its reading of this episode. It's akin to to the kind of sexual violence, right? Um, I and mean, one thing you say about this um, um, particular myth, you say the myth of Erisichthon is an allegory for climate change, and it makes a connection between the abuse of the environment and the abuse of women. Um, and <laughs> the the words are, that Ovid uses. Is, um, so evoke scenes of sexual violence the idea of wounding you see that repeatedly in scenes of sexual violence the word crime in Ovid in the metamorphoses often is a sexual crime um, mm. turning pale a lot of these uh, victims of sexual violence I mean that's an indication of fright and, um, and so to me the there's so many parallels between this scene and scenes of sexual uh, sexual assault and violence but what's so interesting to me is that I think Ovid himself is saying <laughs> This is a story that I, I want people, my readers, to 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 criticize and to and to see the connections between environmental damage and and bodily damage. And um and so yeah. Ovid invites that kind of critical reading. Absolutely. I mean, it seems so prescient. What, what struck me um when I first read it was that it seems so prescient um in terms of its understanding of um uh of nature as being um, uh, more animate than we sometimes give it, it, it credit for um, in, in terms of the idea that, that, that tearing down a sacred, tearing down trees to make a banqueting hall is an act of, of hubris, right? It will be damaging. For, and then, you know, as, as the story goes on, um, er, er, Erisichthon is cursed with ravening hunger right? He just can't stop being hungry and he eats and eats and eats, which is a sort of great metaphor for late stage capitalism. Um, and he prostitutes his daughter to get more money to eat and, and so he can you know, buy more food, um, which again is the connection, you know, a connection between the sort of exploitation of women and the exploitation of the environment and Absolutely. an exhaustive consumption. Um, and in the end, he ends up eating himself when there's nothing else to kind of, and, and I thought that's, you know, it's a wonderful myth and, and, it, and it's, and it really resonates today. And it's an example of a myth that we, I mean, one of the things that, that, that I'm aware of, you know, Ovid is, is such a storehouse of, um, of, of tales that we call Greek myth. It's Latin to be call it Greek myth. Um, and some are told more than others. And this is one that really should, and there's a politics to that. <laughs> and this is one that really, really should, I think, be told more, more often um, than it is. And um, Helen mentioned sort of, you know, Greta Thunberg. I talk about Greta Thunberg a bit as an Antigone figure, but, um, we were saying before the, you know, before this, that um, that the sexual violence relate, you know, in some ways relates to uh, the guy who I can only think of as pizza box guy that's now. Pizza box guy. I think that's a great way. To <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't give him the oxygen of publicity. <laughs> right. Well, uh, yeah, um, Andrew Tate. So I was looking this up. Yes, I guess it struck me the other day that he had tweeted to her. Um, 
uh, bragging about his 33 cars, right? And oh. said, please provide your email address so I can send a complete list of my car collection and their respective enormous emissions. And okay. <laughs> I mean, just the, the latent sexual yeah, yeah. threat of yes. that, right? Um, yeah. Which of course she immediately saw and responded in kind saying, <laughs> um, she yes. yeah, said, email me at smalldickenergy at getalive.com, right? And then, it, then people yeah, really never underestimate, it. you know, Greta. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think, I think so much of the imagery around her has been um, um, evocative of sexual violence, right? I mean, there was um, the Canadian oil firm, apparently, that uh, published a cartoon that had rape imagery, clearly, of her. And so to me, it's so interesting that even today, yeah, we... Um, these these things get connected and so um you know resisting her message um takes on a really um threatening aspect sexually threatening aspect i think that ovid mm. could really understand very well and reading his myth, myth also helps us see um and so i i mean we can clearly clearly see that already but i think ovid rec um, helps us recognize that this this is not new, right? That we're building on a tradition here, a way of speaking about women who are speaking up or a way of, um, you know, viewing destruction of the earth. This is not new. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. So, well, um, can I can I move to talk a bit, can we move to talk a bit more about um, rape and Ovid? Because yes. um, you say sometimes we're deferential to the past and I certainly think that that's true and it's clearly been true with, um, sort of material from Greece and Rome, which has a cultural authority that, that um, you know, particular cultural authority. Um, but more recently, and particularly in the classroom, but not just in, in, in classrooms, um, there's been a sort of backlash against that. And um, as you discuss a bit in your introduction to the, to the translation, um, Ovid's Metamorphoses was one of the um, texts that prompted uh, the call for trigger warnings when students at Columbia University um, said that, you know, we shouldn't teach this without, uh, you know, hefty warning because of its depictions of sexual violence. Um, and, and, and more broadly, there's a lot of um, criticism of uh, classics, the discipline of classics and Greek and Roman material more broadly for um, uh, for underpinning or encouraging or being complicit with um, uh, racism, misogyny um, uh, uh, and so on. Um, and so, so there's been a shift, it, so, so there is deference, but there's also a new kind of animosity Right. towards classics even you know often from classics phd students sometimes faculty members um and this was i mean this is one of the reasons i was grappling with all of this when i was teaching mythology and it's one of the things that you know fed into antigone rising is how we're to navigate um all of this but but let, i mean maybe we should start by saying well you know there's so much rape in ovid um why should we why should we teach them at all why shouldn't we just teach something else <laughs> <laughs> right so I mean I just I'm, I would be interested in thinking about as a teacher what refusing to read him what that would say to my students in a way it's almost like saying well we're not going to talk about this because I'm uncomfortable talking about it um rape is something that perhaps um uh, should evoke silence from me <laughs> um, and so to me that's not really what I would like to to get through instead I want my students to learn how to talk about it right and to talk about um, um, how it's entangled with power um, that rape and power absolutely cannot be <laughs> dis disentangled from one another and so um, one thing that I think is really empowering about reading all of it especially as a, as a feminist and to in teaching this very often to young women and young men who are interested in um, in um, gender and sexuality and, and its history is that um, it gives students a little bit of a distance from our contemporary discourse, like it's not so heated to talk about Ovid. 
Um, they right. they can actually learn to, to speak and think about rape at a bit of a remove from the most hot button issues of our day, right? Yeah. And it's and I also think that there's something, and I, I don't know if I'm going to articulate this well, but there's something really embold, emboldening in a way about seeing something from 2,000 years ago, um, and you know at that point that this is not just you know it's not my imagination that sex sexual violence is entangled with power. Like I see that even in all of it. And so it almost, it, it almost, it, it um, feels empowering to recognize that. Like this is not, this is not just something we, an idea we invented in 1970, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that this, this is actually something that's been long recognized. And to me that, that is really emboldening um, um, to, to see those connections. So my students are able to connect power and rape and the gays and um and you know lack of bodily autonomy and um and and um and gender and all of this in ways I think through reading Ovid that they might not be able to um um if I just sort of ran into the classroom and said let's talk about let's talk about rape within your you know in a way that's really close to you and really um um you know bringing in aspects of you know their lives I don't want to certainly don't want to do that and so to me it's just it's not it's a bit of a remove but in a way that's so still crystal clear with who they are and 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 their lives and they can make connections that I think are empowering I don't know if that all made sense (laughs) yeah no I I I, so I completely agree with you and and particularly the connections that Ovid makes between um uh sort of rape power rape power usually but not always of men over over, over women um and and also and then political power and and yeah. and regimes and, and and his criticism of imperial power which which is sort of left out when people raid the metamorphoses for the myths and don't sort of <laughs> don't see the kind of you know um the sort of the, the teleological point right um that that, that, that it's all about criticizing the emperor probably right. <laughs> no, um, I mean, but it matters the Erisichthon and Tereus, for example, are both kings, right? They have political power. And so right. um, you know, I think that matters a lot. But I mean, I know you you have a wonderful chapter on me too in these rape myths. And I would be curious for you to speak about um, I mean, and you do bring in personal elements to this uh, to considering these these texts and the stories of rape and Ovid. I mean, I would love to hear. Perhaps you read a bit from your book um, about um, encountering these these myths. Um, well, that's very nice of you. Um, where am I? <laughs> Let me. Yes, me. Me too. Wittily. M e t u. Right. Me too. You don't get the joke. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. So, part of what led me to talk about, you know, Ovid and um, rape myths. It's, it's not just the connections he makes between sort of women being silenced, right? Um, in particular with the, you know, obviously with the Philomela and Procne um, myth, but also that he he's surprising. You know, he's always, if you think that you've got a sort of take on, on Ovid, then in another tale, he'll do something different. And, and I actually found him to be quite sort of empathetic um, towards uh, some of the uh, it, um, women who've, um, or nymphs who've been raped. Um, and Tarana Burke, the activist who founded Me Too, the Me Too movement, um, said that her key goal was to promote empowerment through empathy. Right. And I think sometimes, not always, but Ovi does that. So I'll, I'll read a bit. Again and again, Ovid depicts women who are attacked, leaving their bodies and turning into trees or bushes or clumps of reeds. I read these as imaginative dramatizations of the paralysis and dissociation caused by trauma. Daphne's response to Apollo's assault, she's unable to run or speak and a heavy numbness seizes her limbs, captures what happens to victims of sexual assault. Dissociation allows the person under attack to avoid experiencing the assault. Our rather stiff medical vocabulary terms this involuntary temporary paralysis tonic immobility. The feeling of leaving one's body and being alienated from it are well documented 
as, as are their longer lasting effects. I was assaulted when I was a young girl, well into my adulthood. I had very little sense of my body. I was so disconnected from it that it was little more than a vehicle that carried around my head from place to place, from my neck to my knees, could just as well have been made of wood. I read Ovid's Metamorphoses when I was 13 and became fascinated by the story of Philomela and Procne. Philomela was a young woman traveling to visit her sister Procne, who'd recently married Terius, the king of Thrace. Terius accompanied Philomela from her home to his, but before they reached the palace, he brutally raped her. She cried out to the gods for help, but no one listened. When she threatened to tell the world what he had done, he cut out her tongue. I mean, it's an extraordinary, you know, myth of brutality. He locked Philomela in a hut and told his wife that her sister had died during the journey. While Protney mourned, Philomela began to weave. She embroidered the whole story on a cloth, it took a year, and sent it to her sister. Philomela had worried that her sister might consider her arrival and turn against her, but Protney's reaction was rage toward her husband. Now, as an adult, I wince at the lingering description of Terry's rape of Philomela, who's compared to a frightened lamb and a dove smeared with blood, pale and trembling and all alone. Um, and many other parts that, as a, you know, my professorial self is sort of, you know, appalled by, um, including the ethnic stereotyping of Terry's as a Thracian and therefore more brutal. But these were not the parts of the story that gripped my teenage self. I was obsessed with Philomela's determination to tell her story, with the fact that her sister believed her when she did so, and with Procne's brilliant Baroque and hideous revenge on her rapist husband, even at great cost to herself. Revenge fantasies and ancient myths are not scripts to be followed, but they are adrenaline shots for the hurt soul, an essential part of the sexual assault survivor's emergency kit. Um, wow. So I think when students come and say, oh, we shouldn't, you know, I'm not sure we should be teaching Ovid. Um, I think, no, <laughs> you know, just read all of it. And, and right. <laughs> some, um, so. One um, of the most interesting, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, go, go ahead. But just to, to keep thinking about that myth, and I think the way you're reading myths in the book as well is um, that, you know, she presents what happens to her on a tapestry you said it you know you point out that it takes a year and Terius doesn't seem capable of reading this tapestry he comes in every day and he's not really paying attention to this space it's a woman's text right he's not he doesn't really seem to know how to read it mm. um but the sister does right I mean I think there's this way that women can read the same text that a man is looking at perhaps differently right um and right. to me in some ways that's what you're doing with these these myths um, that may, you know, who knows how they were initially reading, but there are messages there that depend upon the reader and the way that the reader is teasing those out. And so to me, mm -hmm. you offer a really great model for reading the messages of myths um, in this way. And, um, and thank you. Yeah, thank you. So well, can, can I, can I, um, can I ask you then, because I, I agree with you that, um, that women can often see different, you know, different things in text and, and do things differently. Can I can I ask you to say a bit about how your translation um, uh, differs from from other translations of of its metamorphoses, particularly in relation to vocabulary of of sexual assault? Because I, I think that's one of the things that makes that makes yours um, so important. Well, I would say that. <clears throat> You know, I'm I'm own, I do own the label of feminist translation, but what I simply think that that means is that I'm scrutinizing my biases. Like I'm not I'm automatically assuming that I'm just giving an objective reading of the text. I'm recognizing that we always bring ourselves to bear in our acts of reading, just as Procne does, right? Um, and so I'm trying to I set really clear goals for myself beforehand that that I wanted to translate sexual violence very clearly. But even as I got into this, other goals became immediately apparent. So one thing that became very apparent was that I wanted to be very careful with the way the body is translated, because mm -hmm. bodies are cultural constructions, too. Right. The ways that we think about the body don't necessarily um, correspond completely to the ways the Romans thought about the body or the Greeks thought about the body and particularly the female body, right? Um, um, or the feminized body uh, too, we could say. But so 
for, so just to talk about that in two different ways. So um, with the, the rape of Filomelo, for example, um, you would have people who rendered that as, you know, he mounted her or he ravished her. Um, mm -hmm. But Ovid's words are clear. He used um, vice, violence, right, against her. Um, and that's a particular kind of violence, right? It's, it, it was, it's as close as you can get to saying rape in Rome. But to me, it's also really telling that that word is used for other acts of violence, too, that threaten the bodily autonomy of another person who should have bodily autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. So you could you could charge somebody with vice for a number of different things, carrying weapons in the city, for example, which is considered to be a threat to the bodily autonomy of somebody else. So um, to me, that word. <laughs> America, please take note. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that the Romans perhaps even more clearly than we do, recognized that rape was a form of violence connected to other forms of violence that simply deny somebody else control over their body and mm. that we should be expected to have that. So I wanted to make all of that very clear <laughs> by using words such as force, right? Um, and rape, um, forced rape, I use that quite a bit, it seems redundant in a way, but I wanted the word force to be there whenever the word vice was used, because there are lots of acts of force that work in the epic, and Ovid connects them under this language of, of vice, mm -hmm. and I really wanted to, to keep those connections clear, so um, I really tried only to use the word force when it came to that word. But, um, but, you know, there are other words, just rapio, that Ovid uses for rape. I tried to, to translate that as clearly as I could as rape. But, you know, there are other um, moments where, say, the body becomes into play. So in Daphne, um, Apollo looks over her body and he's simply looking at her, her eyes. He does, Ovid says they're twinkling like stars, but you know, her lips and her arms, he doesn't use a ton of adjectives to describe them. Um, which is fitting because Daphne doesn't have a feminized body, right? She's out there hunting every day. She's not living um, according to feminine norms. Um, but, you know, translators often say she has teasingly tempting lips. That's David Rayburn or a darling I, little mouth. <laughs> you know, which, so, yeah, which blame, which yes. you know, <laughs> in, present her in a way that makes her complicit with something in a way that, oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Her, she may not want but her body does right and so <laughs> that's a whole her, you know a really harrowing way to think about the body in Ovid um mm. because it's not how Ovid is presenting her body at all um other another example where you know even, not even in scenes of rape but just in um you know bodies that were feminized by the translator in ways that Ovid doesn't so to go back to the Erisichthon story um you know you, you mentioned that hunger um he infects him and this is like personified hunger um hunger personified as a goddess and um and Ovid this is one of his great descriptions of personified abstracts right and so he has the body of hunger and it's a really tour de force description and one thing he says about hunger is that she has a pectus on top of a spinal column and so she mm -hmm. a pectus is the latin word for chest yeah um and so she looks like a skeleton right she's got the rib cage barely covered in skin atop this spine. And it's this real scene of body horror. But every other translator um, she doesn't give her a chest, gives her like dis like long, elongated, bre dangling breasts. <laughs> and so we look at her like as a distinctly horrifying female body, right? And, and not just a representative of what could happen to any human with, with a vulnerable body. Um, mm. And so there were just, it was important to me to, to stay true to Ovid's descriptions of, of bodies and sexual violence. I think those two things are really wrapped up with one another. Mm. Um, so those were some of the goals I set for myself. Mm. Well, I, and I think, I, I think it's, I, I think it's truly important and it's made me realize how some of the tools that some of the translations that we've been using are, um, uh, really distorted and distorted in a way that changes the sexual politics. Um, so, so thank you. <laughs> um, but if we think, so if, if looking with a kind of gender sensitive eye, um, makes us see different things in, in, in Ovid, um, can we also look, can we also look with a, what we might call a trans-sensitive um, eye, 
at some of the myths of um, uh, transitioning, to use a modern term. Um, and I'm thinking particularly here of, of sort of, you know, uh, of the Kainus episode and maybe the if it's an, an, yeah. an Iamphi, Iamphi yeah. episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. Will that, will that, um, what will that do? Right. You know, <clears throat> again, I, this is one area where I was trying to be very careful because I'm, I am cisgender and I recognize that I might not see everything in the text that a transgender person might see. And so, but I was trying to be very sensitive to thinking of how, you know, um, trans identity can open up ways of looking at this text that perhaps had not been seen before. And I really love your reading of the Kynes episode in Antigone Rising, because I think you, um, you were aware and helped make me aware that before the transition, Kynes already was, you know, avoiding feminine norms of behavior. In some ways, Kynes already was identifying, um, um, mm -hmm as masculine, right? And so that helped open up the text to me in a new way um, that informed my translation a lot. So I tried, you know, I was trying to be very careful with pronouns, the way I use the pronouns. Um, and, but also really being um, moved by the fact that everybody in that text, except for the centaurs, and I think even the centaurs, recognize Kynes is a man, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and for the centaurs, it would speak to their own masculinity if they're able to defeat kindness, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the text. Um, he, uh, he's held as the the Moxie May Weir, like the greatest man on the battlefield, right? Um, right. <laughs> so um, I felt that, um, and particularly to my students who are transgender um, or, or non-binary, I think the Ovid stories of of, you know, not just Kynes, but also say Daphne, someone who I think, you know, avoids that kind of binary, um, mm -hmm. doesn't align with femininity. I think it's really affirming for those students um, to mm. read these stories. Yeah, so I would agree with you. And, and particularly maybe if it's an, an Ianth, I mean, with the Kynes tale, it's not clear whether it's a happy ending or not. It depends right. how you read right. uh, the you know um the metamorphosis into a bird and flying off but but you know if it's nianthi is one of the tales that has um uh, uh you know a happy ending um yeah. and and looking at that and also looking at say as, as i do in antigone rising a bit at how um ali smith yeah. um in her brilliant oh, i'm gonna get it wrong now is it boy meets girl or girl meets boy it's girl meets boy <laughs> girl meets boy <laughs> thank you um uh, in her brilliant novel um where she uh she expands on some of the things that Ovid does, but also um, gives it a sort of more, a, a modern political framing, but with a very deft sort of touch. Yeah. Um, and it, it, when I was doing the research for the novel and talking to um, not just students, but you know, other people who read and enjoy myths, um, it struck me how often uh, and how important it is, how often people want sort of some kind of affirmation from, from myths, you know, um, and, and the stories that as a culture we tell repeatedly, the hero's journey, you know, from Joseph Campbell, the, right. you know, and, and the whole kind of hero industrial complex from the Marvel movies and everything. Yeah. You know. um, they're not, that's not the whole picture and actually, um, Ovid and Greek myth more generally gives us, uh, you know, an extraordinary archive for thinking about um, and for trying to understand um, uh, our, you know, our world. And I, I, th I think in classics today, that's the the sort of what how we can use ancient myth to make sense of a very, you know, very challenging, very difficult, very turbulent times is, is really having a moment. So, you know, I think about, um, I think about your translation and, you know, and Antigone Rising, but also um, Mario Tello's um, book that's shortly forthcoming um, on Greek tragedy. Uh, it's, I think it's called Greek Tragedy um, in a Global Crisis, um, Reading Through a Pandemic. 
um, which opened my eyes up to how the myths told in tragedy, um, you know, Niobe, Niobe is the one I, I particularly remember, but um, other myths told in Greek, Greek, Greek tragedy can help us make sense of, of you know, of, of the pandemic and all that the pandemic sort of has brought with it. So future crises, previous crises, um, and, you know, I think tragedy and Ovid do this with a sort of a sense of untimeliness, if you like, a sense of, of um, a complicated temporality where the, where the future and the past and the present are, um, seem sort of slightly out of whack. If you remember in the, in the early days, at least of the pandemic, when time took on a different kind of, right. um, sort of so, so I think all of this goes against in, in one way, the, the, the sort of, you know, trite uh, thing that's often trotted out about myth, that the myths are timeless. I mean, yes, but, but what do we mean by that? Yeah. You know, oh, we actually mean something more, you know, more complicated. Um, but maybe I could put, so having said that, Maybe I could put uh, to you the question um, that, that I imagine some of our critics thinking, you know, um, I imagine some people saying, that, you know, this is terrible, this isn't proper scholarship. Uh, this is all about identity politics and how identity politics have infected the academy. And this is all woke nonsense and too presentist. Yes. yes. What would you say to that, Stephanie? <laughs> Well, I think that this this gets hurled, uh, yes, uh, uh, quite a lot. But um, I, I think I take issue with the fact that why do men get to be objective, <laughs> right? Why, I mean, you know, I think I just talked about the um, the assumption that so many of the translations of Ovid are just objective, right? I'm just bringing my current politics into it, but I actually think that. Um, viewing the the ancient text through a very um you know a lens that is informed by my moment and who I am and my identity actually helps to open up things that are just objectively interesting about the myths that are absolutely there that have just been overlooked for so long because of identity of previous um you know commentators and translators and scholars and readers um and so I think that so on <laughs> for too long we've we've allowed we've allowed not you and i but people have allowed this false narrative that um um that an objecting reading of these texts will reveal you know virtues to emulate right um the the greatness of humanity um our relationship to the gods that these are the timeless questions and things like that but you know, that's not what these the only thing these myths are, not even when they were, um, you know, not even when Ovid was dealing with these 2000 years ago, did he think that that was what myth was for? Um, mm. And so to me, it's about, um, again, if we take the the text of, um, uh, of Philomela, it's about unlocking new meanings through new mm. eyes, right? Mm. Those meanings have always been around. So to me, it's not... Um, to me, it's we're not limiting what these texts mean. We're actually opening them up. Um, it's like new well, eyes would, are, are keys to yeah, unlocking I, them. I would agree with you. And I'd, I'd also note that, you know, um, and I, 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 there's a couple of things. I mean, one is that um, uh, those criticisms tend not to be lobbied when, um, when, for example, Donald Trump is using Aesop's fables in his rallies, right, right. to right. to talk kind of horrendously about uh, refugees and how we ought not to allow them in with the you know the fable of the the woman and the snake, um, the farmer and the snake. So um, so it's it's a it's definitely a kind of targeted <laughs> criticism, um, and I think I think it's also a result uh, that, that this sort of you know, time of being particularly ill, because I do think there's been a shift um, to 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 be to a welcome shift, in my view, to be, to being particularly alert to modern resonances and so on. Is is partly a brushing away of of uh, cultural poetics in the um, in the academy, right? So so just in terms of the way that scholars have um, 
scholars of literature have, have read literature, there's been there's been a real uh, focus for, for so many years on, on contextualizing within antiquity. And that's hugely important. And of course, that's important. Um, but okay. but it's not the only way of, okay. of, of reading. And I, I think it's we've we've exhausted quite a bit of that and are and are looking at, you know, um, other ways that that aren't just what's the religious context, what's the historical right. context, and that's a welcome move as, uh, you know, as well. Absolutely, and we see that with, and we've seen that, I think, if you look at the 20th century and the way Virgil was read, for example, after World War II as opposed to before World War II, I mean, this enormous just upheaval in Virgilian studies, then you have the, the the sort of Harvard School of Virgil. But did we accuse those those people in the 1960s who were taking a new look at Virgil as of being presentist? I don't think so. I think it complicated our view of Virgil. And so we've always done that. We've we've always read these things through the lens of who we are. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah. You know, who's doing well, the, it's more about who's doing the readings. I think today. Um, yes. And yeah. um and I think uh you, you know one of the things that that I discovered. I should have known, and I and I'd got I'd had glimpses of it, but I didn't fully appreciate when I was doing the research for Antigone Rising, is um, how much resistance there is to um, uh, black scholars, black black create back artists, and so on, um, doing their own um, reimaginings of. Um, of of ancient myths, and you know, if we think that the myth is a discourse of power, um, it's been you know historically one of the one of the things it's been used for is to um, is to uphold you know white people's power over over people of color, and particularly black people, um, and just tracing, for example, as I do in the book, uh, how. Venus has been used in Hollywood and beyond to talk about white actresses <laughs> and how Venus is used to, to denigrate um, you know, black actresses and dancers. Um, I was surprised at, at quite, um, how, uh, quite how overt, quite how nasty, uh, quite how obviously racialized um, it, you know, that, that is. And, um, and that's as much part of the history of mythology. And it's nothing that you get from textbooks. You know, I'd studied mythology for years and hadn't, <laughs> hadn't got that. You know, I was aware um, and of, of um, black artists and writers um, reimagining of, of myths to, to give a kind of different, um, uh, more positive kind of uh, politics. Um, and you know that that's a much more optimistic, much more, <laughs> a much sort of happier kind of, and that's also part of the a part of the story of myth. Um, but 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 you know, myth has been complicit in, and and we we turn we turn away from that at our peril. I think so. Absolutely, absolutely. One of and I think that's true with translation and race as well. I mean, one of the most intriguing stories of Ovidian translation to me is Phyllis Wheatley. Um, mm. She translated the Naobi episode um, and drew uh, a lot of, put a lot of illusions could to Alexander. Could you just say who, could you just, uh, just in case people don't know sure, who she Sure, yes. Well, so not. Phyllis Wheatley was um, an enslaved woman. She was kidnapped um, um, at a young age and brought on the transatlantic um, on a ship uh, as part of the transatlantic slave trade from Africa to Maryland, I believe. Um, I think I could be wrong. <laughs> um, but at any rate, she was the first Black woman to publish a book of poetry in the United States, heavily indebted um, to Latin and Greek authors. And um, and in turn to the Niobe myth, uh, which is such a, um, a beautiful myth for her to turn to. It's about the loss of one's child and she mm. herself having been kidnapped, I think is intriguing why she would have been drawn to this myth. Um, um, and just this incredible, just incredible translation of it in iambic pentameter. Um, and Thomas Jefferson was so upset about the fact that she seems to have had this brilliance and really, um, you know, took took her to task in some ways for being an imitator um, of, of of English poetry. The you know Alexander Pope. I mean, she she was alluding to Pope in really interesting ways. But it's me that you know this discourse we have around race and classics and who gets to translate and who gets to read and who who these stories belong to. 
it's as old as the United States almost. It's, it's part of part of our, I mean, again, part of our ambiguous relationship to the past, our ambiguous right. relationship to the past, yeah. Right. Um, do I haven't kept an eye on the time and I should have had, I but may, may, maybe we, um, maybe we could close with um, you just introducing and then reading um, the epilogue of sure absolutely metamorphosis let me, um, <laughs> absolutely let me let me let me put it up here I don't for some reason don't have my book next to me just let me grab it yes. I am um, the f final line of which I you know <laughs> the final word of which um, here's oh. yes the epilogue um you know i i love this epilogue um the romans were not um humble and we should never expect humility from them and i love it when a character like ovid has this last sort of almost defiant moment in his text um he's just compared augustus to to jupiter or to jove and so i really like the defiant element of this particular epi epilogue um but uh, so here we are uh, and also translating this defiant epilogue was a little humbling. Um, I've made a masterpiece Jove's wrath cannot destroy, nor flame, nor still, nor gnawing time. That day which governs nothing but my body can end at will my life's uncertain span. And yet my finer half will be eternal, born among stars. My name can't be erased. Where Roman power spreads through conquered lands, I will be read on people's lips. My fame will last across the centuries. If poets' prophecies can hold any truth, I'll live. I, I think my favorite thing about that epilogue, and I don't mean to go on because I know we're going to wrap up, is where he says he will be read on people's lips. And mm -hmm. so we're all echoing Ovid. Um, but of course, he tells us the story of Echo. And the brilliance of Echo is that even as she echoes, she's able to imbue these stories with her own meanings. And I think that's what approaching myth in this way um, lets us do. We we take the echoes of the past, but we fill them in with our own readings and our own intentions and who we are. And, mm. and I think Ovid invites us to do that really beautifully. That's a lovely note on which to end. Um, it's been lovely talking to you. Wonderful Thank to you talk so much. to you as well, Helen.